I am Nick. I am uh, one of the hosts of uh, the Roll Call Room podcast and um, a law enforcement officer or recently um, no longer a law enforcement officer after almost 20 years in the law enforcement profession. Um, I started in New York City and then I moved down to Virginia where I uh, was a police officer in a small city right outside of D.C. Um, my subject matter expert um, skills in the police department is community policing, uh, where I uh, raised to the rank of a sergeant of the community policing unit, and then um, took a hiatus from the police department and then came back as a patrol officer um, and then started a podcast about um, law enforcement leadership and mental health uh, and the stigma of getting professional help for law enforcement officers and the epidemic that's going on right now with uh, suicides within law enforcement, which is completely out of control. 228 last year, according to oh. bluehealth.org, uh, which is more than line of duty deaths. Um, so far this year, uh, we're a little over 60 suicides this year, according to bluehelp.org. But, but, and I want to knock on wood, we are showing a 30% reduction in law enforcement suicides this year. Wow. Um, and I really attribute that to um, discussions of suicide uh, and discussions of getting help and discussions of taking medication for mental health issues. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why the Roll Call Room podcast is so successful is uh, I'm not, I'm very vulnerable. I'm not ashamed to admit that I've struggled with mental health and um, I've sought mental health profession, uh, help and um, took medication for it or continue right. to take medication for it. So I'm not afraid to say that. So that's what, my long word. What got you into going into law enforcement? Uh, very, very young age, uh, growing up in um, New York City, very riddled with crime when I was coming up, um, when I was younger. I uh, was a victim of uh, an assault when I was in high school. Um, and I remember the New York City Police Department stepping in and doing um, the investigation and doing a really good job. And I remember just wanting to do that and um, this fantastic show that I'm still hooked up, hooked on, which is Cops. Yeah, yeah. Cops, man. Absolutely. I watched that religiously. <laughs> and I was one of those people that believed that the whole entire shift was, the, was those episodes. And that is a freaking lie. That is yeah. a lie. And it's not <laughs> true. I don't tell you about the fucking paperwork. I don't tell yeah. you that shit. But yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it was, you know, the, the, you know, the cliche, which is, is I, you know, I wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference. But in reality, I really wanted to look cool in a uniform and carry a gun and, um, you know, win an argument every single time. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. I like it. Yeah. It's uh, honest. I mean, it's yeah. honest. And, yeah. and I, got, I got free coffee all the time. So. Absolutely. So when you first joined the force, all those ambitions and everything and all those expectations went out the window. <laughs> what did you, what did you, what did you start to realize the, um, the grind was there and what did you start realizing that this is now no longer cops? This is, this is the real career. This is something that yeah. is going to happen. Pretty much right out of the Academy when you go into field training and in the academy, everything is structured. Everything is, is, is pretty safe. It's very static. It's very much like, you know, you will move this way and then I'll move this way and then I'll put the handcuffs on you. Right. When you're in field training and you get out of the car and you show up to your first like violent scene, panic, panic and like fear. Any, any officer that turns around and tells you, that their first time going on a major scene, they don't have fear. They're, they're fucking, they're a liar. Because right. we, I remember looking around, my first scene was a very violent scene. And I remember looking around going, well, when the police get here, this shit's going to be crazy <laughs> to figure out. And I looked down to the left 
and I realized I'm yeah. the guy. <laughs> like I got to figure this shit out, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are looking at you uh, in their worst, at the worst time in their life, they're looking at you. And yeah. if you are not a people person and you're not a problem solver or you're just a miserable person, um, this isn't the profession for you. So for me, where it got real was right in field training. Right. And right. then once you're cut loose from field training, meaning that nobody else is riding with you anymore, that's when things really ramp up because there's no safety net anymore. Now right. it's you. Your screw-ups, or you, you own your screw-ups. Yeah. And that's tough. You know, that's tough. I came up during the era of um, um, kind of like the Ferguson era. I came up in 2005. The hatred for police was starting to kind of die down from the Rodney King era. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Abno Loima era. All the, all the um, police abuse era. That stuff was starting to die down. Um, but we were still getting killed at an alarming rate. And specifically yeah. traffic stops. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I had my children were really small at the time. I volunteered to go to midnights, which was insane um, because I was just out of my mind. I wanted to be in the busiest shift. And why was that? I, you know, I didn't, I, I was an adrenaline junkie, like right okay. from the beginning. I wanted okay. to be in the thick of it. I didn't want to sit in the car and just park somewhere and do nothing. And um, one of my great field training officers uh, told me something that stuck with me. And then I became a field training officer bef before becoming a sergeant. They said, we're going to go get a full tank of gas and we're going to return our cruiser on empty. Meaning yeah. we are going to do nothing but grind and work. Right. Right. The city pays us to work. We're going to work. And we're going to go out and look for stuff. We're going to get guns and drugs and criminals off the street. And that's the way it was 15 years ago. That's the yeah. way it was where you were an aggressive officer and you were rewarded for that type of behavior. You were rewarded right. for crime. Right. And somewhere along the line, probably around Ferguson, that changed. We, yeah. we became more reactionary. We became more fire dispatch, which is you park somewhere, you get a call, you go handle the call, you come right back to the parking lot. Yeah. The... Um, the um, the run and gunning kind of faded out in our profession because you had officers being indicted for doing the right thing. Everything became optics. Everything became optics. Everything yeah. became optics. You're too aggressive. Um, That's what I don't it, understand. What's the definition of aggressive? If somebody's doing something wrong, why why is aggressive in the nature of the conversation? If you ask specific commanders. Um, toxic commanders, anything that you do that you self-initiate um, can be misconstrued as, as too aggressive. Even okay. a traffic stop is too aggressive. Yeah. Um, and that's sad. That's sad because the amount of guns that get off of the illegal guns, let me, let me back up for, yeah. for my, my gun happy people, <laughs> illegal guns that have bodies on them. Um, the amount of guns that I have recovered or illegal narcotics that I have re recovered from traffic stops is immense. It's immense. And all it takes is going up and doing a traffic stop and asking a simple question. Can I search your vehicle? Yeah. And we've turned our profession now into no longer being that type of officer anymore. We're not doing that because we're afraid of a complaint. We're afraid of that, that civil lawsuit. Cops aren't making a lot of money right now. No. So getting civilly sued, they'd be destitute. They, right. they'd, they would lose everything. Completely understood. Yeah. And, and it's sad. It's sad that you have to think that way. It's sad that you have to worry about whether or not if you do the right thing, if you have a use of force, uh, officer involved shooting, use of force, and nobody wants to, nobody wants to, to, to kill anybody. No good no. officer wants to take another person's life, but it absolutely. Yeah, but the yeah. last thing that you should be worrying about is whether or not a grand jury is going to be convened. You're going to be indicted. You're going to get fired. You're going to have to move because yeah. now they publicly put your address out there. Yeah. Min, um, uh, Missouri, uh, Minnesota, yeah. which we'll talk about. Minnesota, yeah, we'll talk about that, yeah. 
within 10 minutes, all four officers' addresses were published. Yeah. Published. That was unheard of back in the day. Well, I still think that's absurd right now. Oh, I, 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 I don't, I don't, it, right from wrong from what, what, what happened and right from wrong for what they did, you don't attack their families. Yeah. And that's, that, that's a different, totally different ball game. I understand that there was a death involved. I, I get that. I, I totally do. And I'm very sorry that it happened. Don't involve kids. Don't involve other family members that have, were not there. They have nothing to do with the situation. That's not well, fair. I'll tell you, when Ferguson happened in Baltimore, I mean, they were pre pretty much very close to each other. Ferguson, Baltimore, and then um, um, the, the choking incident in New York City. Um, I was one of those knucklehead officers who had to identify that I was an officer on my car, my personal own vehicle, and wear every T-shirt that had the thin blue line on it and, you know, warrior written on the back of it and every, everything under the sun. Yeah. And I quickly removed all of those because right. I, was, I was shopping at Walmart one time and this guy walked up and I was walking into Walmart. I was getting out of my car and the guy was like, you're a cop, huh? And from then on, I never, ever had any identifiers. And any of the listeners that are out there, I'd say it on my show all the time. You're making it too easy for you to be a target. Yeah. You really are. Because we're getting into that, that, it's unfortunate. We're getting into that, that time frame in our society where being a law enforcement officer, you have a huge target on your back. And it's stuff like what happened in Minnesota that defines that. It's, it's a couple bad decisions that were made some bad officers that made a decision that we all pay for yeah in this I profession agree. i agree ferguson i paid for ferguson for two years a year and a half what happened in ferguson i paid for in virginia yeah. not even close to to ferguson yeah i paid for it well shit there's 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 riots in what, california right now la or whatever. over it over like, it <laughs> I don't know if anybody fucking knows what a map looks like, but that's yeah. not, <laughs> that's not close. That's and, not here's close. The, and here's the thing. And you know, you know, you and I had spoken and I said, you know, a lot of my fans were, were, were asking for me to, to, to make a statement, to, to do a video or something. And I had put some, some speaking points together. And one of the things that I did was, is the first thing I did was I went on the, vi I, I did research on the victim and I didn't do hit job research. Right. Meaning I didn't go looking for what his criminal history was. Yeah. It doesn't matter at this point. That You're guy, not looking for a dead. biased opinion here. No. You're looking for a straight fact. I wanted facts. Yeah. And the yeah. thing that I wanted to convey was all of these people that are rioting in Target or Walmart or wherever, small businesses, burning, burning buildings down. If you can name three facts about this victim, then you deserve that 55-inch TV. And being black can't be one of them. No. It cannot. It yeah, cannot. If you can name three facts, and, and here's the thing is, is I educated myself about this guy. And this guy was, was in all, I don't know what his criminal history looks like, and I really don't care. Yeah. And I understand what the circumstances were. The store accused him of, of a check forgery or whatever it was. Whatever it was, if you look at the guy's history, the guy was in the security field. The guy had a good job. Um, the guy was, a, he, he was a grinder. He was a grinder. Yeah, he was. And then lost his job. He w went and worked for the restaurant industry and then lost his job because of COVID. They laid him off. So this guy is just like everybody else. This guy's yeah. just like everybody else. Yeah. Um, so I know I went on a tangent, but my, my speech was, if you can name just three facts about this guy, then I'm all for you running into a beauty beauty supply place and stealing three wigs. Right. But if Absolutely. you can't, that's not so that's not social justice. That's you just being that's just you being an asshole. Right. And that's you burning down your own your own fucking city. That's your own, you know, and that's what got me about Baltimore. You're burning down CVS and all these other places. Where do you think these elderly people are going to get their prescriptions from now? They're not. These yeah. are your grandparents. Yeah. It's crazy, dude. I no mean, thought process. But one no. thing I do want to talk to you about, though, is the um, when a call comes over the radio, mm -hmm. I think now officers are more, have that voice in the back of their head. If I go to that call, something happens, that goes sideways, mm -hmm. I'm going to get blamed for it. Yep. Whereas, like you said, 15 years ago, it was like, fuck it, I'm on it. For sure. 100%. No, didn't even cross my mind. I'm gone. 
I can tell I can tell you from experience right around right after Ferguson I go into this um housing project low income housing project and I watch this dude working a door handle what would you be thinking right away he's yeah. trying to break in right challenge him tells me go fuck myself I say hey do you live here tells me I'm not telling you nothing now I got burglary or attempted burglary because I can't identify them. It's private property, all this other stuff. Yeah, well, wouldn't yeah. you know it, it becomes a fist fight, right? So we're on the floor. Some way or another, bad defensive tactics, he's on top of me. I look, I feel on my right side, I feel my gun hood opening and he's got his hand on my gun. Yeah. He's got his hand on the, on the handle of my gun and luckily it's double retention. Right. Uh, so he wouldn't have been able to get it out anyway, but yeah. he's grabbing, he's pulling, trying to pull this thing out. I reach up and I'm dead bug. Like I'm on my back. I reach up and I grab his throat. And the only thing that popped in my head was Ferguson. Yeah. Because now everybody is out in the neighborhood <sighs> filming it. Yeah. And I'm going, I'm on film choking this dude out. And when I say choking him out, I'm at a lethal force level at this right. point. Right. I have the authority. By, by, by Virginia code, by case law, I am the authority to choke you until you pass out and then some because I'm in fear of my life that you're going to take my weapon. And I had to stop doing it and resort to a different defensive tactic that was less, less useful or um, didn't work as quick as it should have because of that fear. Mm -hmm. And after that scene, that's when I started to really reevaluate whether or not I wanted to continue in this profession because I started to sacrifice my safety for public opinion. Yeah. And sometimes they don't mesh like the Minnesota thing completely that video, yeah. that whole thing, the, the defensive tactics, if you want, do you, yeah, let's go into it for sure. hundred percent. We'll go into it. So I just want to, before we do go into it, I want to say one thing. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's hard to stomach that that was your thought and not coming home to your family. You, no. you know what I mean? Like, it's so weird how those two, like, it just, it's, it's, it's mind blowing that. I, and it, and it happened within 10, 15 seconds where I have my hand on his, I have my hand on his throat and I'm going, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to kill this dude. And if I don't k kill him, he's going to pass out. They're going to convene a grand jury. I'm going to get indicted because I'm in a very, very liberal city. They're yeah. going to indict me. Immediately, they're going to suspend me without pay. Yeah. I'm going to be in the press, and I'm going to be another notch. On, I'm going to be another cycle in the news, which is white officer uh, kills black, black male. Um, and then later on, it would come out that he actually did live there. Forget right. about the fact that he denied telling me that he lived there or that he told me to go pound sand, that doesn't matter. Right. And then if I did kill him, the only picture that you would see of him would be in his graduation outfit. Yeah. Not, yeah not, be... it, just a saint, just an yeah. absolute saint, you know? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. but with the Minnesota thing, the defensive tactics that you're trained in the Academy and then periodically for you to keep up your, your certifications in particular agencies, you have to go through DT refresher, defensive tactic refresher. The knee press hold that that officer used on him is only used as a, as a means to gain control for a short period of time and then transition. It is not right. meant for you to keep that knee on there for the entire freaking time. Eight minutes. <laughs> Eight minutes. And, that, and then the other thing is, is I, not, not to say that what the officers did correctly, but anytime a suspect tells you that they cannot breathe, it's very difficult to be believe that they can't breathe when they're yeah. talking. Right. It's the when same as the cuffs breathe, are too tight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. you screaming and yelling means that you can breathe. 100%. Okay? 100%. But yeah, that doesn't yeah. negate the fact that you don't take a heavy set male and put them on their stomach and okay. use that knee, that knee hold. And then you have cover officers just standing around. Don't step in. And, and, and let me tell you something. As a cover officer, I've had to do it multiple times where I've had to step in 
for officers have kind of started going off the rails. Yeah. And you step in, you go, oh, 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 John, 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 I got it. I got it. Go take a walk. Yeah. Go take a walk. Yeah, you tap out all the time. That's your job. For sure. Your job. Your job is to render aid. Yeah. Like, yeah. And the, the part that frustrates me the most is I'm all about leadership. I'm in the process right now, and we'll talk about it later at the end. I'm in the process of writing a book right now about, about uh, toxic leadership in, in law enforcement. Look at that video again and tell me how many, how many sergeants or lieutenants are on scene. Yeah. None. Yeah. None. Nobody with stripes or above are on scene. Right. That is a failure of leadership right there. And you can't tell me that you can't hear on the radio things are breaking bad quick. Because that was a very chaotic scene. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah. I mean, as a sergeant, because I was a sergeant for seven years, had I have shown up at that scene, uh, several things would have happened. First of all, the guy would have been, the guy would have been brought up, put on his butt, leaned up against the 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 tire, go get the guy some water, call EMS because now the guy is saying that he's having a medical emergency. Now you have to render aid to him, whether he's full of shit or not. You have to render aid to him. And there was no supervision there. There was nobody there. Yeah, but there's common sense, is there not? Common sense. Com- that, that completely went out the freaking window. No, yeah, I, no I, I agree. I, that went south so fast. Like, it's upsetting. It really, <clears throat> it really is. Because there are, ter- there are times where you, where you do use that knee, that knee, um, that knee hold. The I knee agree. hold is only used to gain compliance, get the handcuffs on. But if you look at the video that, that's floating around of the girl the, there was a lady behind that car behind his car the guy that oh, died okay the one with the busted window yeah the, that's yeah. the only way i can remember it because she has yeah. a shattered window and i'm like that's a violation but um <laughs> but she's recording this thing and the officer forcefully extracts him out of the the car and applies handcuffs on him while he's in the cove of the doorway right so so you already have him in custody. Right. What's the deal? Like, why are we bring? Why? It just it upsets me to the point because now we're all going to have to pay for this. We're going to have to pay for this for a while now. Yeah, and not monetarily. That that that's a guarantee. Minnesota better. I mean they they better, they better remember the 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 combination to the bank uh bolt <laughs> because they're going to yeah. be paying a shitload of money for that. Yeah, no, I agree. And I work with a lot of people in law enforcement and I know that, you know, they do the, the, the shoulder chap tap where they're like, okay, you know, you, you, it's time for you to go take a walk and, and yes. this one off and, and, and I'll deal with them. Fresh eyes, fresh mouth, fresh nose, yep. fresh everything. Yep. Right. Let's let me just go, go relax. Take it easy. Right. They do it all the time, all yeah. the time. Why couldn't they have done it here? Why couldn't one of them now, is it the alpha male type of situation? Is the, the one that has him down the ground, the, the big boss man right now? Is that, is that what was going on? And nobody contempt wanted. I think it was contempt of cop. Oh, probably. I think it was contempt of cop. I mean, I don't remember what the agent officer that was standing there, what his name was, but that guy right there, he should have stepped in, man. He should have stepped in. He should have been. And he was crowd control. His, yeah. his main focus was, to keep the crowd back and make sure that nobody gets ambushed from behind. But you got four of you there, yeah. four of you there. Um, I'd be intrigued. I'm always the, I'm always the person that's like, listen, let, let the investigation take its course. Agreed. I want to see the ME's report yeah. on, yeah. An, on any law enforcement custody death. I want to see the ME's report. What did he die of? What was in his system? What did he die of? If it's ruled homicide, I'm all for it indictments up the wazoo uh but i can't see it not being that i just can't i just can't see there being any other reason than asphyxiation or or the guy's a big guy you just don't put him on his stomach for a long period of time like that you're taught that in the academy yeah it's crazy well see unfortunately the other the other three officers now i bet you that's exactly what's going through their head what if why didn't i you know yeah and it's one person's bad actions, but then people are right now saying, okay, well, like you said, it's leaders. Let's start at the top and let's work mm-hmm. our way down. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, let's see who is really responsible for this. Um, Travis, it, it, it's tragic. Um, yeah. And let's find out exactly what the means are 
to, um, to, to properly move forward with this without having it blow out of proportion the way it has. And the unfortunate part is, and I'm not, I'm not playing a race card game here, but the way it played out is very repetitive of mm-hmm. the nature. And now because low income areas are now protesting, now they're getting, being involved a lot more. Now there's theft. Now there's, like you said, there's half of Missouri's on fire right now. Like wh- where, where does this, um, where do we stop blowing things up and where do we stop t- communicating and, and deciding on what, what the action is going to be? Because those officers aren't going to come out of their house for another two more fucking weeks. Like, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're, they're on lockdown now. Nobody's going to, Oh, they're, they're gone. They're out of state. Well, there was, Oh, well, I would hope so. Yeah. A hundred percent. But, um, even like the, the, the protesters were like, Oh, somebody's ordered pizza here three times. And we've told them who lives here. And the pizza man r- ran away. That's not fucking helping anything. What are you trying to starve them? Like, is this, yeah. is this what, like, yeah. are we back I'll tell to you the this. 1400s here? And is this a castle <laughs> that you're about to raid? Like, well, I got to tell you, I mean, immediately, this is the way that it is in, in, in law enforcement, the profession. The chief needs to step down. Chief needs to resign immediately. Yeah. Uh, starts at the top. The community cannot heal with the current uh, leadership of that agency. Yeah. The other thing is, is I'd love to know what the demographics of the Minnesota Police Department is, because you can never get the demographics 100 percent to meet the, um, the communities that you serve. But you can get pretty damn close. Fair enough. If your demographics. Let's not pick on Minnesota anymore. Let's just pick on oh man, my fans in San, San Antonio are going to be pissed. I'm just <laughs> going to pick San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. San Antonio, Texas, I don't know the stats. I'm just making them up. So please don't send me emails, folks. Let's say San Antonio is 60% African-American, 30% Caucasian, right? Yeah. Your police force is made up of 85% Caucasian, 5% African-American, and then mixed everywhere else. It's not going to ride anymore. No. Those days are over. Right. It's not going to ride. And you need to actively go and seek that demographic for recruitment. And if you're not getting it in San Antonio, you need to get your ass in a, in a van, an a recruitment van, and go two towns over or state over and start recruiting to level out the race of your agency. Yeah. And that's where, that's where some of the, the level-headed protesters' arguments come from. And they're right because – the, the community is the police and the police is the community. Mm-hmm. And you cannot have, you can't have a, a, a police force of 95% Caucasian. You, can, you just can't. Ferguson taught us that. Ferguson was like over 90% uh, a Caucasian. I think they only had like two or three African, African-Americans. But, but my argument to that would be, are African-Americans applying for, to be law enforcement as they much should. as... They should. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, but is the amount higher than 5%? Yeah. Right. That, that would be my argument to the question is if we were getting enough influx of, of applicants that were African-American, then sure. Yeah. We can live level, level it out, but if they don't really want to apply and they don't really want to be a police officer. That is the problem right now. That is the, that is the major problem is, is that when you go to recruitment events, a lot of the African-American com- community will not, will not, apply for the position because they don't want to seem like they're going against their own. And you can't have that mentality. You can't have it both ways. You can't ask for change and then not be part of the change. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. You have, you have to step up at some point. You also have to not have a criminal record to be a cop. Yeah. So the ones that are like, I'll do this job, but they got 16 felonies. You're not going to make a good cop. Like, yeah. It's just not going to work out. So I agree with you, which is if the applicants aren't there, that's another problem. But it's a culture. The culture in law enforcement has got to change. Um, and just hiring African-American chiefs of police every single time as your fix all as a municipality or a city or a county, that's not yeah. the fix. You putting um, an African-American chief of police doesn't make you uh, doesn't, doesn't make big. your agency level. I mean, yeah. that's just asinine. Yeah, that um, is, yeah. You need a real good proven leader. 
Um, but I think for, for Minnesota to, to, to start their healing process, I think this chief has no choice. He's got to resign. And it's unfortunate because maybe he's good, but he has to. It starts at the top. Yeah. And you said, uh, you said earlier, you were talking about how, um, like, uh, the, it's one bad situation that happened. That's all it is, but it's Mm -hmm. not all it is, but it's one bad apple, like we say. Right. Mm -hmm. And that changes the demographic for the entire country. Like that thing, sorry, I should say it changes the mindset of the entire country. Okay. Now, now I hate cops again. Like I, I was fine two days ago, but now I hate cops again. Yep. So then, your your application processes go again go down because nobody wants to be a cop but yep. then how do you get back how, what's the best way besides having the chief step down but how do you get your uh reputation up through the community again to start getting uh people's awareness of you know yeah we're called out only in the bad situations but you know it's a hard job we we're doing the best we can we have some bad apples yeah where do you start from there where do you start the healing process after that well i think a couple of different things i think one um every agency should have a citizens academy and they should recruit specifically in their um low-income areas okay because a citizens academy um is it like a a it's like a police academy for citizens it's a police academy for citizens it's usually like a 12 week one day a week uh, you come to police headquarters and you learn about police procedures. You learn about how, why the agency does what it does. You learn why there is a CDU unit, why all, why they have the tanks, why, they, why, 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 why. Right, I, okay. It's a fantastic way, ride-along program. You've yeah. got to get into these communities and get these folks in cruisers and get them to see what other cops see on a daily basis. Um, And I think we need, as a profession, we need to reevaluate what the police are for and what type of enforcement we need to be doing in this profession. Yeah. And I think COVID has taught us that. I think utilizing cops to go into restaurants and close down a restaurant because they have 11 patrons instead of 10, we look like the assholes. Yeah. We're the bad guys. Sending the police out to go to the park to kick kids out of a park because it's closed for COVID. We're the assholes. Yeah. If stuff like that, that we need to change, we need to change the culture of how we're enforcing the law. Yeah. And also some of these books, these laws that are on the books, some of these politicians need to reevaluate why they're on the books. Oh, <laughs> we only enforce the rules that are on the books. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. We don't make them up. Yeah. There are, there are some crimes that I would enforce that I would just be like, this sucks. Like, I've I don't heard that hundreds of times. Yeah. I've heard it hundreds of times. It sucks. It sucks. Yeah. Like, um, listen, you don't pay child support. You don't pay child support. It, 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 it is what it is. I don't want to get into that debate. But we are utilized to arrest people for not paying child support. That's a civil matter. Yeah. The civil matter. You are failing to pay for child support, but you're utilizing the police to strong arm somebody and put them in jail for not paying child support. Maybe not the best example, but it's stuff like that. Yeah. That's not what the police are for. And the police can't be in the community doing community policing because they're running around to handling bullshit calls for service that they shouldn't be handling. Yeah. No. And we can get into the drug, the drug thing, decriminalizing drugs and, and all but, that other stuff, it ties a lot of officers up. But ironically, the whole COVID thing, when it first kicked off and people were quarantined, if you want, well, it depends on where you were, did whatever, yeah. you, whatever terminology you want to use to your house, your, your estate, um, law enforcement had a lot more opportunity to do law enforcement stuff. Yeah. Like they weren't worrying about traffic violations. They weren't worrying about like, they were, they were on the streets trying to get the, the drug dealers. They were on, they, they were doing what I thought was because I never saw them and I knew a lot of them and I knew they're, they're like, Holy shit, we're fucking busy. We're not, we're yeah. not like, okay, so I shouldn't say we're, we're busy. We're not, we're not uh like you, like you, you'd be setting up your traffic, you're doing your traffic stop somewhere or setting up your gun somewhere to make sure they're doing uh, uh, speed checks and mm-hmm. all that stuff. And he's like, we're not doing those right now. We got other things to deal with. Mm-hmm. And it's, it almost turned the focus. Yes. And then now we have a situation that arose not just because somebody died, 
but because everybody's been sitting at home all fucking time and now mm -hmm. they're pissed off. So now they're using this, I think, as a bigger reason to do a lot more of the, 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 the violence of, that we see going out right now than they, than they would have if we weren't in a COVID situation. I, I'm not saying it wouldn't have turned into a riot situation, but no, I don't think it would have been blown up as much as it was just because of the situation we're in with COVID right now. Yeah, That's yeah. the way I see it. Yeah. And I will tell you with COVID, what we learned was calls for service drastically reduced with people being home quarantined or whatever terminology you wanted yeah. and self-initiated activity within law enforcement skyrocketed Yeah, for departments that were not given stand down orders. Right. And I can tell you that multiple law enforcement agencies, including my former one, gave specific stand down orders. You come into work, you park your ass in a parking lot, and you stay there. I okay. don't want to hear you on the radio doing traffic stops. I don't want to hear you doing subject stops. You do not do anything. You sit there and watch Netflix. Yeah. But the ones that were not doing stand-down orders, their self-initiated stats were going through the roof. Right, Guns and right. drugs off the street. Yeah, because yeah. the ones that were not following home quarantine, it, they, were, they were doing not good things. Yeah, we had a saying on midnights. There's only three type of people that are out after 3 a.m. <laughs> Hookers, <laughs> criminals, or somebody that's about to be a victim. Yeah, and I they kind of go the that. same with COVID. Yeah, they're either out getting the essentials at the grocery store, or they're up to no good, or they're just they just want to get out because they're 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 stir crazy. Yeah. So COVID taught us that, which is is that police departments need to reevaluate what they're going out for calls for service on right why are they going on these stupid calls for service it's not a necessity and a lot of the stuff that law enforcement officers are going out on is civil it's not criminal it's civil mm. we're not attorneys <laughs> no we're, I agree. yeah we're here to enforce the law so that's my tangent man i, I no i me. yeah i agree it's funny uh, i was going to jokingly say you know the amount of uh and i said this on somebody else that i was talking to the amount of officer tiktok accounts rose oh, oh, 10 hundred <laughs> percent so it was uh oh God, it dude. was very interesting so oh my God. um i do want to talk about i do want to talk about uh your podcast though for a little bit and i want to I want to know why did you start it? You said to help other officers and to kind of get stuff off your chest. Yeah. But um, what was the main goal and why did you, you said you wanted to help people, but why, why did you want to help people? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the very, very short story of it, which was um, I was a Sergeant for seven years. I had a Lieutenant that I worked for that absolutely devastated my mental health. Um, pretty sure that this lieutenant was bipolar amongst other things and absolutely just decimated my mental health. I hated going into work. I was burning through sick leave like it was going out of style. I brought it to my chief's attention. I filed a hostile work environment claim. It was ignored. I resigned. Um, went to another agency. Worst decision I made in my life. I lasted two weeks at that agency, called up my chief, said, hey, I want to come back to work. I want to come back to this agency. I said, can I come back? He's like, yeah. I said, well, what am I going to come back as? He says, I'll bring you back as a sergeant. They make me go through the hiring process all over again after only being gone for two weeks. I get it. I understand. I know. I had the same reaction. I go uh, to sign my, uh, my offer letter for me to start work, and uh, they lied. They brought me back as a patrol officer instead of a sergeant, and they cut my pay by $10,000. And they had me, they had me because I didn't look for any other jobs because I hadn't intended on going back there. Right. And I came back and, um, April 29th, 2019 was my first day at work. Uh, get called into my captain's office. One would think for an inspirational kind of conversation. Hey, welcome back. I know this is difficult for you. You're not a sergeant anymore. You're going to be working with a whole bunch of people that used to. Yeah. No, nah. it was, you did this to yourself. You created this mess. Um, and if I hear you talk badly about the department or the chief of police, you will not make it off of probation. Um, just devastated me. Just, yeah. just, just my mental health continued to, to decline to further in the embarrassment. They put me on probation for a year. Now, mind you, I'd been with the department for 14 years, but they put me on probation for a year coming back. 
to further embarrass me even more, they made me go through field training all over again yeah. with an officer with two years on. And that was extremely embarrassing. And it progressively got work, worse. They did other things here and there. May 25th, 2019 was the culmination. I tried to take my life. And that was a lead up to the stressors of the job, mm. not dealing, it, dealing with it in the ways that I should have dealt with it. And thankfully, I'm still here and I, I was not successful and I toughed it out. I, I stayed with the department. I never told the department about what I did to myself. I never, I just kept my mouth shut, but I went and I got help. Yeah. I went and I got therapy. Good. I went and I got medication, which... I hate medication. Um, I don't even take medicine when I got the flu. So I was very much against medicine, but I took it and it worked. And then the medicine that they gave me, then it stopped working. And then I got new medication that stopped working. Then I got another medication. So I tell that story because I want people to know that the first shot, uh, it may not work. You need to stick it out and you need to, you need to be honest with your, your therapist or whoever you talk to. Um, fast forward, to October, I started to realize and do a lot of research as to um, why the stigma and why law enforcement suicides were so high in 2019. Now, we lost 228. So by October, we were right around like 210. And all I kept on thinking about while I was reading up on bluehelp.org, I kept on thinking to myself, why is this not more public? Why, where... What could I have done? Where can I have gone to get the help that I needed to get? Why isn't this being publicly talked about? Why are officers so afraid to turn around and talk about how fucked up they are? Why are they so afraid to turn around and be like, hey, listen, I was fucked up. I went and got help and I'm taking medication and I'm still working. I'm still carrying a gun. Yeah. And why? I know why, but I'll let you tell your yeah, story. Yeah. Well, it gets, this is where it gets interesting is so October, October 27th, my partner, my good friend of mine, uh, and I, we were union vice president and president. I was the vice president. And, um, we said, listen, this just isn't right. Um, we had to do something. Let's just, let's do a podcast. I knew nothing about podcasts. You know, the, the regular big, big podcast that, you know, millions of people listen to, um, where they get made, paid a lot of money, not like you and I, but, um, so um, we start and in October, you know, first episode comes out, 60 people listen to it first day, 60 people. The next day it's like up to 150 and it's like 300. And then we release another episode and then we release another episode. And then by November, we were right around 15,000 listeners. And then in December, we hit 25,000 listeners. That's when the chief of police called called me into the office to talk about this. So I know, I know this story, but I'm going to ask you, what does the number fucking mean? Why, why 25,000? Why did that make such a difference between 15,000? Cause I'll tell you right now, 15,000 is a lot of, it's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, it's just like the guy from Seattle, Washington that did that, that video in his cruiser. Remember, you know, you heard yep. about that, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. At 400 didn't make a difference at 400,000. Now it's not containable anymore. Now I can't control what you say. Okay. Now you have a fan base and now I need to be concerned that your voice is louder than my voice and you can overrule what I decide as the chief of police. And that's where positional equity comes in. Right. That's where your fear of my message, um, it scares you that my following can overrule you. And that's not what the intent was. Mm -hmm. And I had walked into this, this meeting with the chief, the assistant chief and the director of human resources. And right away, the chief was like, I want to talk to you about this podcast. I'm getting a lot of heat from the commanders that you're putting down these commanders within the agency. And I said, well, chief, first, I'm going to let you know right off the bat, it's not coming down. I'm not taking the podcast down. He's like, oh, I'm not going to ask you to do that. It's your first amendment right. Um, we'll get to that later on. But, uh, uh, sure, that's what he was thinking. <laughs> and um, 
you know, at that point I had gotten maybe 15 or 20 emails from people that had attempted to take their life or were about to take their life and started listening to the podcast and now went and got help. Yeah. And I had printed those out and I slid it across the table. And I said to him, I said, I remember this because I was pounding my fist on, on the conference table. And I said, how could you not get behind this? How could you not turn around and say the blah, blah police department supports Nick and Mike, their, their podcast and be cutting edge, be, be something greater. And his response. And I said to him, I go, are your commanders pissed because I said it or because it's true? Yeah. He yeah, said, maybe it's a little bit of both. And I said, well, then that's a problem for you. That's not mm -hmm. a problem for me. He goes, well, listen, you got 25,000 listeners. Do you have to tell specific stories about commanders in this agency? Or can you say that you heard this story from a fan in Texas? And I said, no, I can't do that because I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to my fans. It's all about integrity. Tell your commanders to get their heads out of their ass and start treating people properly. Tell the commander who, who told me April 29th that it was my fault that I left, that, that, that put the gun in my hand that almost took my life May 25th. You do that. And um, he was like, all right, well, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to send it to the city, uh, city attorney's office and, and uh, you know, get, a, get their opinion, their legal opinion, make sure that you're within your parameters. I know there's some First Amendment issues. Um, he's like, but um, one of the commanders brought up uh, a violation that you actually, all, actually are guilty of. And I was like, I have, we had an attorney. So I was like, what the fuck? And he was like, um, went on your website and um, you're selling T-shirts and uh, you don't have an off-duty um, uh, form uh, to, uh, to have off-duty employment. And I said, well, the podcast doesn't make any money. So what do I need an off-duty? Well, you're selling T-shirts. And I'm like, really? I said, you're going to get on me about $10 t-shirts? And this is indicative of our profession, which is, is if I can't get you on this, I'll get you on that. That yeah. vindictive <laughs> behavior. Yeah. That seek yeah. and destroy behavior. Yeah, you have a busted taillight, buddy. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. It's like I, I, I can't get you for speeding, but I'll get you for that busted taillight. Yeah. yeah. So this goes on uh, December. Mind you, I'm a police officer. So I'm yeah. just the the grunt, right? The lieutenant's process comes out in my agency. And the way that they wrote the lieutenant's process was, is all you needed was three years as a sergeant. And I had had seven years as a sergeant. So I put in for it. And anybody in law enforcement or in the, in the, in the private sector, or in your profession as well, when promotions start happening, the daggers start coming out. Oh, yeah. People start getting cut through. So the fact that I was taking the lieutenant's process as a patrol officer hit a lot of egos amongst sergeants. So I took the process and I scored number four. There were five, there were five promotions that were coming up. Wow. I may. February 20th, the city attorney gives her opinion of the podcast, gives us the thumbs up that we're within our rights, our First Amendment right. The 21st, I get initiated an internal investigation with the accusation of theft from a year ago, a year ago. Hmm. I won't get into the specifics of the, of the theft th allegation, but it's so erroneous and so far fetched that it's ridiculous. Yeah, I bet. And ultimately I was on probation. Mind you, I'm on probation. So I can be terminated at any point within a year because I'm an at will employee. Mm hmm. They initiate this investigation February 21st. My probation ends April 29th. They sit down with me April 20th and do my interrogation. April 25th, they, they give me a notice that my police powers are uh, suspended until the chief makes the determination of my employment. Mm -hmm. And they said my interview that they had with me showed um, – deception. I said, okay, order a polygraph. I'll take a polygraph. Yeah. And anybody that tells you that they want to take a polygraph 99.9% .9 of the time, they know they're going to fucking ace that polygraph. Yeah. 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 They wouldn't order it. 
No. They wouldn't order it because we were in COVID and our agency can't do a polygraph on another officer. Another agency has to do it because of oh, bias. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's fair. They didn't order it because it would have put it over my probationary date. Right. They refused to order it. And I basically, I told them, go pound stand. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. Left. It was yeah. the best decision I made. It was, this podcast was worth dying on the hill for. Yeah. It's way too important. It's now at a hundred thousand, a yeah. hundred thousand. It's way too important to just walk away from it. Um, I think, so the, that, message, that's I think the message is what's important. Like you were saying, right? Like, like you said, going, it's almost like they had the guillotine set up for you. Oh, the automatic. Entire time. Oh, as, my soon God. As, you, as soon as you walked in that door coming back, it's like, Oh, let's close the curtain over here. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? And, like, unfortunately, well, fortunately for you, it, it, you, you have something that's, that means probably more to your heart right now than dealing with fucking politics all day long. Yeah. But financially um, it sucks, but you know, like, you know, it is what it is. And, um, you know, uh, it is, it is created other things because then once I left, then you start really seeing like things behind the scenes. You see people like take 10 steps away from you. You see people that you thought were your friends um, that were supportive start disappearing. And that's indicative. I mean, that are, they, are they disappearing because of fear? Like you're talking about people in the, in the department, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that because of fear? Is that because yeah. they don't want to be associated because With, it might happen to them yeah. or. Yeah. Because I am, I have been labeled like rogue. Like you don't want to be attached to me because you don't want to see the same punishment happen to you. Uh, so the chief pretty much set the tone that, um, you know, stay away from this guy. So um, it's sad. It's sad. And it's not agency specific. One of the great things about having the amount of fans that I have is getting emails from people that are like, oh my God, I went through the same thing. Not about a podcast, but the same thing. Yeah. Is yeah. you are, we're a paramilitary organization. Law enforcement's paramilitary organization. They say jump, you jump. They say crawl, you crawl. You're not to question it. But the thing about it is, is that we have such weak leaders in law enforcement right now. You have to question what, what orders they're giving you because nine times out of 10, they're not legal and lawful orders. Um, and that was the thing. That, we weren't talking like on the show, we weren't calling out or we weren't telling fictitious stories. These were facts. These were facts that were exposing commanders for being unqualified for their jobs. And it pissed them off. It really, really pissed them off. So much so that even now that I'm gone, when I do a Facebook Live, these commanders create fake Facebook accounts to log on to my Facebook Lives and make comments. Oh, shit. Isn't I have way better perfect? shit to do with my fucking time than yeah. worry about people that have talked bad about me or may talk bad about me. Dude, like Way better thing I can think of with my time. You know, and what's funny, it used to piss me <laughs> actually, It actually used to piss me off. Like the first four or five lives, it would piss me off. Yeah. And um, I did one the other night, and they did it again. And then last night, I made a music video about it to the music somebody's watching me from Michael Jackson and it's yeah. fucking hilarious dude it was so therapeutic <laughs> but the, the the way it is it it's obviously getting to them and yeah. they don't like they don't like talking or bucking the system yeah and my book that I'm currently writing if they don't like the podcast they're certainly not going to like that fucking book right <laughs> so right. <laughs> so yeah. It's, 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 long it's ironic though. You pick two mediums, which have absolutely zero regulation. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you know, we did our research and you, you know, we knew that when we started the podcast, Mike and I, when we started the podcast, we honestly thought they were going to shut us down after the first five episodes. Yeah. We really honestly, because our, our, our agency had a reputation of like, yeah. just like most agencies and it didn't happen. And then the sixth episode and the seventh episode, and then before you knew it, it was like, it just exploded because law enforcement officers um, or first responders in general are starving for that type of media. They're starving for honesty, vulnerability, yeah. 
Yeah. And especially when you turn around and you tell them that they, that you have struggled through mental health and you, you don't know me from Adam, but I, I was one of the most jovial people on the job. I was always making people laugh. I'd show up at crime scenes. We'd make jokes. I would always keep it lighthearted. Yeah. And if I got bought, brought to the brink of taking my life, what about the guy that's getting a divorce or the gal yeah. that's in financial ruin? Or, 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 or the one that's at, you know, drinking every single night or, or taking drugs or whatever it is. What about that person? Yeah. It's just, it's asta yeah. it astounds me because you can't put your head in the sand and act like there isn't a mental health crisis within law enforcement with the numbers that Blue Help publishes. You can't. You can't dispute. The, and those are the ones that we know of. What about yeah. the ones that we don't know of? And we haven't even gotten into retirees yet what's the what's the department's um philosophy on this like what, what do they do they they if there's mental health that that needs to be looked at mm -hmm. for any officer um what's the protocol is it more of um okay we'll 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 see you help and then we'll go from there and that's kind of like plan a b and c and that's it or do they actually have a set of protocols that they're gonna do and try to actually see to the end is it okay basically do they actually give a shit or do they not give a shit like that's, okay, kind of that's a that's a very good question the answer to it is is that they don't give a shit and okay, and okay. it's and it's not agency specific it's pretty much across the u.s so or or across the world is it funding time. sorry i want to go through that yeah. is it is it a funding it, issue it, okay. part of it is funding the other part of it is is that we have such a recruitment problem in this industry right now that if i recognize ptsd as a disability yeah and workers comp recognizes PTSD as a disability yeah. as a state or as an agency, you're fucked. You're yeah. fucked. Yeah. Because if I do a PTSD screening on one police department, we'll just pick one. Let me look at one of the patches on my, uh, my wall here, Chicago. Okay. I guarantee you that 40 to 50% of the law enforcement officers in the Chicago police department would test positive for, for PTSD. Now, if the state allowed, you to go out on medical retirement for PTSD. Think about that. 50% right. of the workforce would be, be gone. Be be gone. It's not in the agency's best interest to recognize PTSD or mental health as a disability or to recognize it as something where you should be paid disability pay for the rest of your life. Right. They don't recognize it. And typically what winds up happening is, is these law enforcement agencies have peer support groups or critical incident scene management groups or other catchphrases, but they're checkoffs. They're checkoffs for them to turn around and go, hey, 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 we care about mental health. We have a peer support team. Yeah, he showed up. Yeah, we have a peer support team. And then here's the fun part, and, and this goes for my <laughs> agency. Yeah. When you look at the list of officers that are on that peer support team, because they'll give you a list. When you go to somebody for help, you say, hey, listen, I'm struggling. The peer support lead or sergeant will turn around and go, hey, listen, I got a group of people. Here's a list of people that you can go and talk to. Every single one of them usually is a shit bag. Right. Every single one of them, I wouldn't tell them my dog's secrets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's a problem. One of the things that we need to get away from is calling it a peer support team and call it a peer support agency. Every single officer should be t trained in peer support. I should be able, if you're my best friend and you and I go out on the street every single day and I'm struggling, I should be allowed to go to you. Right. I, you shouldn't have to go take a process to be on a peer support team. Right. I should just go to you and be like, hey, man, listen, I'm struggling. And that's not the case. That's not the case in a lot of agencies. Um, and it's sad. And they're reactionary. Yeah. My agency has lost uh, a, a couple of officers to suicide. And you think that we would have learned from it, but we, we don't. We're reactionary. Uh, it's cheaper to lose officers than it is to put them through therapy. Oh, absolutely. And then what we do is we ostracize the shit out of them. Yep. Like if I would have told, I never, even to this day, like the only way that my agency found out that I was on uh, antidepressants was through my podcast after I left. Had right. they have known, had they have known, they would have sent me for a mental evaluation, a fit for duty. They would have put me on administrative leave pending the results. And then if it was within my year of probation, I would have, they wouldn't even had to do the theft investigation. That would have been the right. way to get me kicked out the right. door. Right. 
but the officer that's there for 20, 25 years, you know, you just kick them out. Like, like those years, those years of service didn't matter. Uh, and it's compounded. The longer you're in this profession, the worse the PTSD gets. Are they doing this to like, they're not doing it to everybody, but are they, are they cherry picking who they want to succeed in this career or <laughs> are they just, are they just blowing everybody off of the fire hose? That's funny. Uh, you, mu- you, you must have logged into my, my book that I'm writing, which is, is um, there's a full chapter on um, hookups and clicks. Hookups and clicks. Yeah. Um, it's the good old boys club, and it's still going on. If I like you and you're what we call a golden child, you can get away with murder. And that's in any agency. And I'm not talking about my old agency. That's everywhere. Yeah. It doesn't matter. State trooper in, in Jersey, state trooper in Minnesota, it doesn't matter. Um, they, they do cherry pick. If I don't like you in the law enforcement profession, and I've seen it as a sergeant, I've seen commanders target specific people that they do not like. And that's, it's, it sucks. And a lot of the, the civilians outside of law enforcement don't know that that, that shit's going on. They yeah. have no clue. They yeah. have no idea. And it's sad. It is. It is. Um, so what advice can you give people that actually want to make a career out of it and they're getting into law enforcement? I, I, I say we can deter them or we can go on the other path, but what yeah. would you say to give them the gleam of hope that, you know, this could be a career for you, but this is what I recommend you do. Yeah. I will tell you, um, I love, I love the law enforcement profession. I love it. I miss it. I've been out of it now for a little over a month and I miss it. Um, it's a fantastic job. No day is ever the same. Uh, so I want to get that message across, which is, is don't mistake my negativity towards poor leadership and poor commanders um, and the lack of help with mental health as a deterrent for you to do the job. I want, I, what I, my advice is, is to be mentally, to be mentally prepared to get into this profession. And I think what's fantastic about the millennial generation joining our workforce, which there aren't a lot of pros to it. <laughs> Those of you that are millennials, take it easy. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we all do. Yeah, yeah. What's fantastic about them entering the law enforcement community is, is that they have grown up around suicide and mental health and yeah. getting help. Yeah. And that's going to be fantastic for our industry, for our profession, is because they are not going to be afraid to ask for help. They are not going to be afraid to take medication. Um, and my advice to them is don't allow this job to be the only thing in your life. There has to be a life outside of this profession. Yeah. Because the biggest mistake that I made was I made the job my entire life. So when it disappeared, everything else disappeared. Like that was it. That was my nine to five. I didn't work nine to five, but that was everything to me. And when that was gone, I didn't have anything. You have to have a delicate balance. If you join this profession, Um, you have to have friends that are not in law enforcement. You have to, or else it creates an us versus them mentality. Yeah. You know, that's actually, that's ironic that you just said that I was just talking to somebody who uh, just left the military that mm-hmm. was the exact quote that they said. You mm-hmm. can't have just vets as your friends. You have to have civilians. Yeah, and, and I tried to do that when I was on the job because uh, civilian friends are the best because they love hearing cop stories. <laughs> so, like, yeah, if you only have cop friends because you want to just tell cop stories and reminisce about all the times you kicked indoors. Everybody's got a better story. Thing, yeah, you can do the same thing with civilians. And it's even cooler because... They don't know any better. They just, yeah. They're just they just amazed. Everybody yeah. loves live PD. Everybody yeah. loves that show for a reason. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic job. If we can just get our commanders and our leaders that are in charge of these agencies to wake up and realize that we're not in the dinosaur era that they came up in, things will get a lot better. We either need for those dinosaurs to die off or retire off, and we need younger commanders, younger chiefs of police with, with bigger mindsets to take over. Um, I think we're going to see our profession within the next five years, if that happens. 
within the next five years, I think our profession is going to t- take a really good pendulum swing the other way. Good. If it doesn't, I think within the next five years, we're going to see homicide rates and a new drug war that has never been seen in, in world history because the officers, the vets that can dr- spot um, hand to hands and can do narcotic enforcement, they're dying off real quick. And yeah, I don't yeah. mean dying off. They're just retiring. They're just leaving. Off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and when the drug off. war starts, there's not going to be nobody to know what the hell to look for. Yeah. So that's my long-winded 